Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today we're talking about why we love our favorite foods. Mm, this episode is going to make me hungry. It's going to give you a lot of food for thought. <laughs> yuck, yuck. <laughs> it turns out what we think is tasty isn't just a matter of opinion. A lot of science is behind it. We'll hear all about it after this. We asked our listeners what their favorite foods are and why they like them. My name is Cass and I'm five years old. My favorite food is fries. They are crunchy and salty. Sometimes they're too salty for my mouth. Hi, my name is Vivian and I am nine years old. My favorite food is oranges. I love them because they are sweet, healthy, and fun to peel. My name is Coven and I'm seven years old. My favorite food is pancake. I love the maple syrup. The maple syrup's the best when I add it. My name is Niam. I'm five years old. And these are the things I like. I like pasta, pizza, and I like popcorn with pity pity on it. All these foods sound delicious, and Niam really likes foods that start with P, apparently. But what's pity pity? I've never heard of that before. His mom told me that's actually peri peri, a chili flavored spice. Okay, well, so I noticed a lot of like salty, sweet, and spicy foods in that list. I wonder why that is. <laughs> Let's ask the rest of our listeners, what's your favorite food and why do you like it? When we come back, we'll talk to a scientist to discover the science behind your favorite tasty treats. Our expert today is one of our favorite guests, Rob Dunn. He's an ecologist and a science writer. Oh, he was in our episode, Discover the Wildlife of Your Home, which is all about insects that live in houses. So are we going to be talking about eating bugs here? <laughs> Fortunately not. Rob has written a book about the evolution of flavor and the things we think are delicious. His research started with questions about what we choose to put on our plates. What do we know about how we choose, what we choose to eat, and then how that's changed over time? What did our ancestors eat, and how did they choose? Rob's curiosity made him think about the world before refrigerators, before kitchens, before farming, even before fire, to what humans only ate what they could find on the land. So if you imagine your ancestors out in the environment, they're in a jungle, and they need to find food. The trick for them would be, how do they find the right foods that their body needs? Ooh, so we're going back in time to our hunting, gathering past, when the world was a giant mystery supermarket, in which you've never heard of any of the foods, and some of them might kill you. Exactly. Our ancestors had no packaging to go by telling them what's healthy and what's not. They had to rely on taste. Part of what taste does is it's a kind of evolutionary trick that leads animals to find those things that tend to be rare in the environment and leads them to avoid those things that tend to be dangerous. Uh, so what does that mean? In general, things that you can eat from the land are harder to find than things you cannot eat from the land. <laughs> yeah, I guess for every uh, ear of corn, there's like a thousand rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Taste guides us to the kinds of things that we need and warns us away from what we shouldn't eat. So avoid those rocks. <laughs> so what kind of tastes are we talking about here? So scientists use taste to refer just to those sensations that come from what is detected by taste receptors on the tongue. Taste receptors are inside our taste buds, those bumpy little hills on our tongues. And scientists have matched those receptors to the taste that we know. 
So the tastes that everybody agrees about are sweetness, and so this is a sugar cube, sour, and so think about a lemon, saltiness, salt, um, bitterness, which is like if you drink some of your parents' coffee, that ugh, is bitterness, and then umami. Uh, umami, the taste that's most fun to say, but hardest to define. <laughs> it's kind of savory. We experience these tastes every day as part of the foods we like or don't like. But for our ancestors, those tastes were more importantly signals for what they needed to survive. And so for our ancestors, nitrogen was rare. Nitrogen is an element that's very important for our bodies. It makes up some of the most basic molecules for life. And it's found in foods with umami tastes. And so umami taste receptors rewarded them for finding that nitrogen. Huh. So umami isn't tasty just because it's tasty. It's a clue for what's inside that food. Right. And think about how we crave sweets. I crave them so bad. <laughs> that's because sugar is a molecule that's really important to our bodies. I can actually have a cookie now. Our ancestors also needed sugar to keep the energy going through the body. And so sweet taste receptors evolved to reward our ancestors for finding sugar. Wait, so where do they find candy in the jungles? Do they have those little candy shops where you like <laughs> scoop up candy and buy it by the pound? Because I love those places. <laughs> no, their sugars were in the form of plants like fruits or natural sweeteners like honey. Okay, so even though he wasn't eating candy bars, I can still blame my sweet tooth on great, 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 great grandfather Ugg. <laughs> yes, you can also give him credit for your dislike of bitter things. And so bitter is usually a warning, like this is poison, you shouldn't eat it. Bitter is like a big flashing danger sign for your mouth. Now sometimes by the time you've tasted something and it's bitter, it's too late and, uh, you know, it's killed you. But trial and error is tricky. Lots of poison in the prehistoric mystery supermarket game. I can't imagine how that supermarket stayed in business. <laughs> Fortunately, humans could learn and remember things. The other thing that happens, though, is that once you find things that, are, that aren't bitter, that don't seem to be poisonous, and you start eating them, you start to learn that they're good things. And so your brain kind of builds up a little library of what's good and bad. So here's what will kill me, and here's what will not kill me, which I think are probably the two most important categories in life. <laughs> exactly. And get this, kids are even more tuned in to good versus bad taste than adults. How's that? One of the things that we know is different in adults and kids is that kids tend to like tastes that are a little bit different than adults. And so they have more fondness for sweet things and salty things and they dislike bitter things m more than adults. I guess that explains why our listeners chose salty or sweet foods as their favorites and nobody said like radishes. <laughs> <laughs> or coffee. <laughs> or coffee. <laughs> These preferences go back to prehistoric kid lifestyles. And what we think is that this was useful when all of our ancestors were living as hunter-gatherers and so they just had to go f hunt and find their food Hunter-gatherer kids also searched for food, mostly on their own. So you're saying they had no adult following them in the forest saying, eat this broccoli, eat it. <laughs> it's good, I'll put cheese on it. But there was also no one to keep them from straight up eating poison. So their bitter taste receptors basically were the ones screaming at them instead. If you take one more bite of that, mister, you will die! <laughs> Kids also need more salt than adults do, so they were even more driven to find salty foods. Kid tongues are really tuned in to avoid bitter things and to go straight for that kind of salty, sweet, fatty potato chip that also maybe has some other weird flavor associated with it. So basically, pickiness kept kids alive. Yeah, back then, Parents weren't trying to raise adventurous eaters. Eating was the adventure. <laughs> and so was just living. <laughs> Rob says that in a way, kids are still hunter-gatherers. When your parents aren't looking, if you're in the kitchen and like you're standing on the tall chair to get to that cabinet where maybe you think there's sometimes chocolate, just think of that moment, that bold exploratory moment as being very much like 
what kids used to do when they were all looking for fruits. They were digging in the ground, maybe to find a beehive where there was a bunch of honey. And so you're reenacting very ancient traditions. That scene is definitely played out in our house, but how do we know kids used to do that? Parents didn't write it down. Caught little Ugug sticking his hand in the beehive again today. What a little scamp. (laughs) That's a good question. So we can study ancient bones, we can study ancient stones and stone tools. But one of the most powerful approaches that scientists have is to study our closest living relatives, and so chimpanzees and bonobos. Wait, chimps and bonobos? How do they tell scientists what our ancestors were up to? Chimpanzees and bonobos are not our ancestors, but they provide a kind of window into how our ancestors might have lived. Our hunter-gatherer lifestyle wouldn't have been too different from our primate relatives. Searching for food without cooking or farming, and chimps in particular, have similar tastes to us. The taste receptors of chimps and those of humans are very, very similar. That's why scientists believe that studying chimp eating habits can help us build a picture of our own past. As we look to chimps, they can provide us a way to think about the choices our remote ancestors would have made when living in the forest and climbing through trees and looking for fruits. So if you see a chimp spit something out, you probably won't like it either, especially after the chimp's been chewing it. (laughs) Yeah, it's only been recently that humans invented something that would change our food forever. The first agriculture is about 12,000 years ago. So like 12,000 years ago seems to me like kind of a long time ago. I definitely don't know anyone who was alive back then. I'm talking recently in the whole history of human evolution. Before agriculture, which means farming, humans spent around 7 million years hunting and gathering. So we were hunter-gatherers for much, much longer than we were farmers. Just a blink of the eye, but it transforms what's available to us in terms of food. After we started to farm, we could choose foods that one, wouldn't maybe kill us, and two, tasted good. From there, taste became more about flavor and deliciousness than survival. Fast forward about 12,000 years and we have pizza and popcorn and pancakes smothered in maple syrup and french fries covered in salt. So I get why we prefer certain tastes in general, but why do some of us like foods that others don't? Yeah, so there are lots of reasons that we have differences in our own tastes. Part of that is physical, but hidden deep within our cells in our DNA. And so, for example, different people have different genes that make their bitter taste receptors different. And so you might detect something as bitter that my tongue doesn't detect as bitter. Oh, wow. So the same food that tastes bad to me really doesn't taste bad to you? Exactly. So that's the physical part of our taste. The other part is our experience all the memories and smells that come along with eating food. And so the details of what you've eaten, where you've eaten, which of those things have made you happy, teach you which things are are good smells and which ones are bad smells. So your experience around food has a lot to do with how those foods taste to you. Exactly. But even though we get to decide on our own favorite foods, our tastes are really shaped by our ancestors who had a lot fewer food choices than us. And so if you think about your ancestors, think about someone gathering. That is true for the nearly the entirety of our human story. I think our ancestors would have really appreciated a piece of pizza once in a while. I feel like it just makes me appreciate pizza even more than I already do. So think about your favorite food. What tastes are you experiencing when you eat it? The known tastes are sweet, salty, sour, umami, and bitter. Which of these tastes makes your food taste so good to you? Now think about your experience. Is there a smell or a memory that makes you like that food more than others? Draw a picture of your favorite food and describe on paper what makes it taste so good. Then send it to us. We'd love to see it.
Thanks to Rob Dunn, professor in the Department of Applied Ecology at North Carolina State University and professor in the Center for Evolutionary Hologenomics at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. With Monica Sanchez, he's the co-author of Delicious, The Evolution of Flavor and How It Made Us Human, which is a great science book for adults. Thanks also to Cass, Vivian, Kai, Kevin, and Niam and their parents for sending us their favorite food recordings. If you want to learn more about the science behind our tastes, listen to our bonus interview episode with Rob. It's available to patrons who pledge just $1 a month or more on patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. Learn more about the science of taste and flavor at our website, sciencepodcastforkids.com. You can also upload your drawings and photos to us there or email them to tumblepodcast at gmail.com. Claire Glendening is our intern. Sarah Robertson Lentz designed the episode art and is our head of partnerships. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote and produced this episode. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all of the music. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and join us next time for more stories of science discovery.